Can union members sue the union for injunctive relief for failing to comply with its own constitution without alleging that every single member of the union authorized the action? To find out, you have to read Agramonte versus Local 461, but it's 12 pages. Don't have time for that? I've got you covered. This is TLDR, Too Long Didn't Read, where I cover New York Court of Appeals cases, and I try to do it in five minutes or less. This is the episode on the case of Agramonte versus Local 461. The citation for this case is 2024, New York Slip Opinion 01332, published by the New York Court of Appeals on March 14th of 2024. The issue in this case is whether members of a, of a, of a workers' union can sue that union for injunctive relief in the absence of allegations that they could sue every individual member of the union for that same relief. Uh, to explain the context of this case, it's important to understand a couple of things. First, is that a union that's unincorporated does not have the same abilities as a union that's incorporated. A corporate, an, an incorporated assembly or association is basically a person under the law. But an unincorporated union is just an association of people. And if you want to sue that kind of an organization, every single member of that organization has to equally be liable for the thing that you're trying to sue them for. That's according to General Associations Law 13, which specifically says that uh, an action or special proceeding may be maintained against the president or treasurer of an association if all the members of the association have equal liability jointly or severally in some substance. And there's a case from 1951 from the Court of Appeals called Martin versus Curran that reaffirms that, that understanding of, of that statute. And it says that the complaint must articulate that the members of that association authorized or ratified the conduct for which the union is being sued, or else you can't sue the union, okay, under that General Association's Law 13. What are the facts of this case? The facts are that Local 461 is a union that represents the lifeguards of New York City's Department of Parks and Recreation. And the lifeguards of New York City's Department of Parks and Recreation, there's around 30 full-time all year round lifeguards. And then there's about 1,100 seasonal lifeguards who work from May to September when the beaches and the pools open for New York City. Under the locals' constitution, which basically controls how the union works, all lifeguards are eligible to be for membership so long as they pay their union dues every 15th of the month, every month. To vote in an election, a member must be in good standing as of the date of the election. And to run in an election, to run for office in the union, you have to be in good standing for a year, for 12 months before the election, or three years of running for president. Okay? That's the background here. In February of 2021, the union's vice president sent out a notice just to the year-round lifeguards saying that there was going to be a virtual nomination, followed by an election later that month. Some of the seasonal lifeguards requested recognition that they were members too, and they could vote, and they also wanted to run. Uh, they wanted they wanted recognition that they could both vote and be qualified to run for office. DC 37, which is another union, said it would refer it to the to the to 461 for action, but no action was taken. Okay, so some of the lifeguards wanted to some of the seasonals wanted to run for office. The election committee determined that they were not eligible to run, and they conducted the election. At that point, an action was filed. A claim was filed seeking to uh, a complaint was filed against the union seeking a TRO, seeking a temporary restraining order to stop the stop the election or to rerun the election. The Supreme Court denied that application. And then they amended the pleading to say that the election was conducted in violation of the union's rules because it excluded the seasonal lifeguards. The union then moved to dismiss and said, hey, wait a second, under Martin versus Curran and General Associations Law 13, any complaint made about the union must include an allegation that could be applied to everybody. Are you saying that every single member of this union authorized or ratified the conduct that's complained of here? And they say no. The Supreme Court granted the motion to dismiss because it didn't sufficiently plead that every member of the of 461 authorized or ratified the, uh, the actions that are complained of. Goes to the appellate division and they affirm it. They say, you're right. And even if we take the, the pleadings on its face, the, the seasonals are not sufficiently members for a year before the election that they should be able to vote or they should be able to vote or run uh, based upon that uh, based upon that con constitution. It goes to the Court of Appeals, and here they draw a distinction. Their holding is, yes, Martin versus Kern still applies. Yes, General Associations Law 13 still applies. But we're going to distinguish between a monetary damage that's sought and injunctive relief. When it's monetary damages, yes, every single member of the association has to be equally liable or authorized to ratify the conduct. But where it's injunctive relief, like this one, 
where you're trying to have the union do something, that's what injunctive relief means, then the Martin versus Curran rule does not apply. That it does not, you don't have to prove or allege that every single member of the association did the, did the complaint of conduct or else a union could just run amok and do whatever it wanted and never be chargeable with anything. So that's the holding of Agramonte versus 461, that it does not apply when injunctive relief is being sought as opposed to monetary relief. Have a good day. If you like what you just saw and want to see more just like it, please hit like or subscribe to let me know. 